Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with question number one from Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when ministers last met the Acting Chief Constable of Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I meet regularly with the designate Deputy Chief Constable of Police Scotland, who is currently leading the service while the post of Chief Constable is vacant. My last meeting with him was on the 28th of March 2018. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. SNP policy on policing has meant police staff have been cut. Trained officers who should be on the front line are instead doing desk work that should be done by staff. That's what the SPA report yesterday confirmed. So we now know that the thousand extra officers promised by the SNP weren't doing what the public would expect. They were, in the words of the SPA, backfilling civilian roles. So does the minister agree with me that we should relieve the pressure on our local forces by redeploying those officers to frontline duties as defined by the acting chief constable yesterday? And if not, how many officers is he prepared to lose by the end of this parliament from Police Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. So no, so I'm not clear whether the member welcomes the fact that we did see a significant increase in police officer numbers under the uh, SNP and that continues to be uh, the case, the member uh, may be aware or may not be aware that when Police Scotland published its uh, 2026 strategy last year, which is the first time we've had a national strategy for policing in Scotland, they set out the need to rebalance their workforce to make sure that the level of staff they had alongside the number of officers and the changing nature of the crimes which you're experiencing, uh, that they were able to deal with that as they move forward. And that's exactly the work which has now been taken forward, something which at that time, if I recall correctly, the then Justice Spokesperson of the Labour Party actually supported and recognised the need to rebalance the uh, workforce. And that work has uh, started and is now moving forward uh, under Police Scotland with oversight coming from the Scottish Police Authority. And alongside that, there has been independent assurance being provided by HMICS, uh, who are looking at the increasing operational capability which the force is focused on taking forward. And that's the strategy which they set out last year under 2026 and which has now been taken forward. The focus here is on making sure that the service has the necessary operational capacity and that they increase their operational capacity in order to make sure that that is in place. And in relation to uh, police officer numbers, which I know the member uh, has had uh, a lot to say on in uh, the last uh, day, or, uh, day or two or so, uh, regarding the three-year financial strategy. Uh, the member may be aware that just yesterday at the Scottish Police Authority uh, board meeting, uh, this very issue was looked at. And Police Scotland and the SP have made it very clear that their focus is on building police capacity. Uh, and that the paper which was provided to the board was for illustration to express how much they could actually create in terms of increasing operational capacity. And the key fact here for the member is that the key is that the figures do not equate to a reduction in officer numbers. And the SPA made that very clear during the course of their board meeting yesterday. Liam Kerr. In 2014, Mr Matheson told a parliamentary committee that there are no plans for us to change our position on the 1,000 extra officers. That commitment remains and I intend to take it forward as the new cabinet secretary. Given that promise was broken, how does he expect BTP officers to trust him when he says he'll protect their pensions? Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, as often is the case with Liam Kerr, he often gets his facts mixed up and uh, very often isn't aware of events that have taken place since then. As you will be, be aware of the election that took place in 2016, where we set out very clearly about the need for the police service to be able to rebalance its, uh, its, its workforce. What we are not doing, though, is the approach that the Conservative Party have to policing in England and Wales, and that is slashing almost 20,000 police officers. And as a result, we can see the very significant problems that the police service right across England and Wales have as a result of the sheer incompetence of Home Secretaries over a number of years in managing policing in England and Wales. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. As far as I can tell, Labour have expressed four different positions on police numbers since 2007, and Daniel Johnson, in a rather confused GMS interview, expressed another one entirely yesterday as well. And their previous justice spokesperson supported decisions regarding police numbers being the responsibility of the Chief Constable, yet they now seem to be against this. Is the Cabinet Secretary as confused as me over the position of the Labour Party? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. 
But I suspect I did hear uh, Daniel Johnson on GMS the other day there, and I must confess it was one of the most confusing interviews I've ever heard in terms of what Labour's position is actually on uh, police officer uh, numbers. And if you think it's rubbish, just go back and replay it in iPlayer jacket and you'll be able to hear how confusing it actually is for yourself because it was, a bit of a, it was a bit of a comedy exchange, to be perfectly frank. But what I can say is that I'm not clear about what the Labour Party's policy is in this matter or any other matter for that fact. Uh, but what I can say is that we as a government are very clear about the need to make sure we continue to support our police service. And that's why over the course of this Parliament, something which the Labour Party didn't do or any other parties is a commitment to maintaining police budgets and making sure there's a real terms increase which allows us to invest an extra £100 million in our police service over the course of this parliamentary session, continuing with the reform fund of another £31 million being invested into our police service this year, and alongside that, being able to secure the money which has been pinched from them for years by the Tories and not been able to reclaim that, allowing them to retain that and invest another £25 million into our police service. This is a government that's investing in our police service and will continue to do that in the years ahead. Neil Findlay. When the Cabinet Secretary uh, last met the, Chief, assist, uh, the Acting Chief Constable, did they discuss the call that I've made uh, repeatedly for an inquiry, police, inquiry into the police and the minor strike? It's been 17 months since we met the Cabinet Secretary, along with retired minors, their union reps and legal representatives, and we still have not had an official response. When will we get an official response to that call? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, so the answer to the first part of this question is no, and as I've said to him on a number of occasions, it's a matter which I'm continuing to give due consideration to. Thank you. Question number two, Fulton McGregor. Side officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making towards introducing an opt-out system for organ donation. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. The Scottish Government is committed to introducing a workable soft-out option a system that will add to the improvements already being delivered and legislation to provide for such a system will be introduced before the summer recess. It's important that we take the time to get the system right. It needs to be developed in a way which will do no harm to the trust in the NHS or to the safety of donation and we're working with stakeholders to achieve this. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that answer. Last week I hosted a roundtable event for Kidney Research UK on renal regenerative medicine. We heard from a range of stakeholders on how Scotland is leading the way in life sciences. Can the Minister advise how the opt-out system can work in tandem with the regenerative medicine to improve outcomes for kidney patients? Minister. Uh, thank you and I thank the member for his uh, question. Opt-out will of course work alongside the range of different measures we already have in place including the work on regenerative medicine. We know that for opt-out to be successful it has to work alongside other measures and will be part of the ongoing improving outcomes for uh, patients. We also recognise the potential for re research in regenerative medicine to lead the transformative new approaches for the treatment of renal disease. Officials from the Chief Scientist Office are currently in discussions with uh, Kidney Research UK around collaborative uh, funding of research in this area. Question number three, Claire Hockey. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports the promotion of tourism in Rutherglen constituency. Minister Alistair Allen. The Scottish Government fully recognises the importance of tourism to the economy and endeavours to promote tourism across the whole of Scotland. We appreciate that uh, Rutherglen, like all constituencies, possesses its own unique attractions, including its magnificent town hall, a five-star Visit Scotland rated arts venue, which plays an important role as a visitor information partner in the I Know Scotland scheme. Visit Scotland will continue to work with local authorities, destination <coughs> management organisations and businesses to ensure that each of Scotland's destinations is well positioned to offer an exciting and enjoyable experience to tourists. Clear hockey. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware of some of the fantastic tourist destinations in my constituency, ranging from the urban park of Cunningar Loop to the David Livingston Centre, the historic buildings, parks and cycle trails, as well as the place where William Wallace was betrayed, to name but a few. Visit Lanarkshire and Visit Scotland poorly serve my constituency, often misaddressing venues, as in Glasgow, or not promoting local amenities, instead directing tourists elsewhere in the area. Can the Minister give an assurance that the Scottish Government will liaise with these agencies so that opportunities for tourism and visitors are not missed in my constituency? Minister. Well, while uh, many of these are operational matters for, for Visit Scotland, I, I recognise that the points uh, the member uh, is making. Visit Scotland is committed to serving the whole of Scotland and we want to ensure uh, that their work is efficient and accurate. So the information available on the Visit Scotland website uh, is often, it should be said, provided by businesses who may choose 
uh, to self-identify as Glasgow businesses. However, I understand the members' concerns and I will ask that Scottish Government officials raise this as part of their regular engagement with Visit Scotland. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sure the Minister recognises that culture is a driver of tourism. And on that note, would the Minister agree with me that we should do more to see regions appoint cultural ambassadors who can play key roles in supporting and promoting tourism throughout Scotland? Minister. Well, uh, certainly communities and uh, ambassadors for communities uh, have a major role to play in supporting uh, and promoting communities, as the member says. Um, for instance, uh, Visit Scotland has information partnerships uh, throughout Scotland now, uh, and uh, there are, for instance, uh, many, I'm sure, in the, the constituency which the member uh, represents. We're very keen at all times to look at new ways uh, of ensuring that these, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, measures have success. Question number four, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much to ask the Scottish Government whether it will remove any legal impediments to council-run bus services. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government will shortly introduce a transport bill which will give local authorities the flexibility to pursue partnership working, local franchising or indeed uh, running their own buses, allowing them to better respond to local needs. Lewis MacDonald. I welcome that answer. The Minister, I'm sure, will be aware that First Bus continues to cut services in Aberdeen most recently the X40, 25, 16 and 9, and that Aberdeen City Council has stepped in to secure alternative services for those communities. Does he agree that the City Council should be enabled to set up uh, in business directly if it is its judgment that that is the best way to secure frequent, reliable and affordable services in future? And if he does, and I welcome the commitment he's made to covering that within the bill, but will he ensure that the bill does not provide a veto to commercial operators for any such decision? Minister. Well, clearly, once the bill is introduced, the, 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 the devil no doubt will be in the detail, and I will look forward to amendments uh, through the bill process uh, from right across the chamber. But yes, the premise of what he says is something I absolutely agree with. The entire purpose of the bus element of the transport bill is to give local authorities more powers than they've ever had uh, over their transport services, including, of course, their bus services. I think local franchising will be of interest. I think enhanced partnership will be of interest uh, and, indeed, potentially municipally owned bus companies. So I look forward to his contributions uh, once that transport bill is introduced. And Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Whilst broadly supportive of the uh, principle of municipally owned services, my concern is that these might prove disproportionately costly to councils in rural and island communities. Uh, as many of these services are effectively lifeline services and may require quite substantial subsidies. Can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government has given any consideration to the concept of central funding support for these types of councils, and if so, what the cost implications of doing so may be? Uh, the Member will be aware, but it's <coughs> worth reiterating that we fund bus services to the tune of around about a quarter of a billion uh, pounds, of which, of course, an element of that is the BSOG uh, grant, which goes to the bus services uh, the operators uh, direct, but also, of course, to local authorities, they have the ability to fund services uh, that have been withdrawn but are perhaps not profitable but, uh, but uh, socially necessary. So there already exists some mechanisms for them to do so. Uh, once the bill itself is introduced, of course, it will be accompanied by a financial memorandum. And as I say, there will be a wide-ranging debate, no doubt, in this chamber uh, around uh, some of the provisions of that. What I would say is that for municipally owned bus companies or for local franchising, it will be important that we get the checks and the balances right. Uh, we want to ensure all of us here that patronage increases on our bus services as opposed to the trajectory we've seen over the last few decades. And I'll work with any member of the chamber, including, of course, Jamie Green, uh, on, on any sensible measures forthcoming. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how recent developments at NHS Tayside could affect the delivery of patient care. Cabinet Secretary Shula Robertson. The Scottish Government's position on patient safety is very clear. It is and will remain paramount. That's why we have committed to continuing to provide brokerage to NHS Tayside to protect and maintain the quality of patient services. There is no evidence of any impact on the quality of care being provided to patients in NHS Tayside. John Brown and Malcolm Wright have made it a priority since taking up post to engage with staff at all levels and to provide reassurance that day-to-day -day operations will be minimally affected. Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? NHS Tayside is now facing brokerage approaching £44 million, which will have to be repaid in due course. When I and other members met the new management team at NHS Tayside two weeks ago, they were not able to give us any assurances uh, that the uh, cost savings that would need to be found would not have an impact on delivery of frontline services in Perth and Kinross, where 
there have been public concerns over a long period about services at Perth Royal Infirmary. So can the Cabinet Secretary give me an assurance today that notwithstanding the problems at NHS Tayside, there will be no further reduction in the services available at Perth Royal Infirmary? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, the priority is protecting patient services, but that obviously doesn't mean that patient services won't uh, evolve and change over time. And Murdo Fraser will be very aware about the Shaping Surgical Services Review. Uh, I'm sure he's had many meetings uh, about it, as have other uh, local members. Uh, I, uh, the proposals do constitute major service change and as such require ministerial approval. And of course, I'll con carefully consider all the available information and all representations before coming to a final decision in the best interests of interests of patients. What has been very clear though, and I'm sure Murdo Fraser has, has been told this on a number of occasions, is the A&E services at Perth Royal Infirmary will continue. That is important for, for local people. What is being talked about here is where unscheduled surgical care uh, is delivered. And I think we have to make sure that the two things uh, are not conflated. Tom Arthur. Last month it was reported that NHS Tayside is on the cusp of the eradication of hepatitis C in Tayside, having treated more patients, a higher proportion of people with hep C than in all other parts of Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this is an outstanding achievement um, by NHS Tayside from which many other health boards can learn? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, yes, I, I'm aware that NHS Tayside has been at the forefront of efforts to tackle hepatitis C for many years now. And actually, I met the staff leading on this at the recent Tayside Staff Awards, and uh, they are reporting excellent progress on their elimination aim, very much in line with the government's uh, aim of eliminating hepatitis as a public health concern across Scotland. Um, I know that hepatitis C clinicians uh, across Scotland do meet regularly as part of the national uh, network and are learning from each other's uh, approaches. I think Tayside has a lot to offer uh, other areas of Scotland. I'm also aware that the Minister for Public Health is due to visit the hepatitis C treatment centre in Tayside later this month and will, I'm sure, learn more about the approach at that visit. And that's Sarwar. The Cabinet Secretary says there's no evidence of impact on services, but treatment waiting times are actually getting worse at NHS Tayside. And they also tell us they have to make £200 million worth of savings over the next five years. The BMA, the RCPCH and staff are telling us that the pressure is like nothing before and that is impacting on services. Surely the Cabinet Secretary accepts that savings and cuts relate to more pressure on staff, more pressure on services and more patients being failed. Cabinet Secretary. Well, what is true, of course, is that NHS Tayside has to live within its means, as other boards do. And, of course, over the past uh, few months and years, indeed, uh, NHS Tayside has been found to uh, be um, a bit of an outlier on many aspects of service delivery, which is why, of course, they need to address things like agency spend, for one, where they are have been traditionally a high user of agency spend and prescribing costs, another example where again they've been a high user uh, of prescribing costs compared to other boards. So there are areas in which they can make changes that can uh, make sure that the frontline services that patients receive are not impacted. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when the A77 M77 main arterial route between Ayrshire and Glasgow is scheduled for repair. Minister Hamza Youssef. Our trunk road maintenance contractors have a responsibility to frequently inspect the A77 and the M77 to identify defects and repair uh, the most serious as quickly as possible. Um, connect the DBFO company which maintains the M77 between junctions 5 and 8 has a resurfacing scheme underway that will resurface at least uh, 7.5 kilometres of lane length uh, uh, and being carried out uh, uh, currently from the 16th of April uh, for overnight closures uh, between 8pm uh, and 6am. It's anticipated that works will probably take two to three weeks uh, to complete and of course this follows uh, severe deterioration experience as a result of a severe winter. Uh, our operating company Scotland Transserve which maintains the A77 and other parts of the M77 has a programme of structural maintenance and patching planned for throughout 2018. The programme is currently under development and will be shared once it's finalised. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? And he's correct that uh, I, I met with Transport Scotland last week uh, to discuss this, and, and lo and behold, uh, the repair started the next day. And far be it from me to suggest 
and it was that meeting that instigated that. But as you said, trunks road, trunk roads are inspected every, every week. And I wondered, how can roads be allowed to deteriorate to such a bad state before action is taken so bad uh, from, from, from the south of Kilmarnock that there's now temporary road signs appearing on a dual carriageway from Moncton to Kilmarnock where there's no plans to do any work. I wonder if the Minister is aware of this and what can the Scottish Government do to ensure these critical repairs are made to this arterial route? Minister. Far be it for me to suggest that the power of Brian Whittle is only limited by the ego of Brian Whittle, uh, if possible. Uh, but uh, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, I say that, of course, only in jest. Uh, in, in, in all seriousness, uh, I would say to Brian Whittle that uh, we have maintained the M77. £50 million has been spent uh, since uh, 2007. On top of that, we, of course, have the South West Transport uh, Study as well. But, of course, if he has specific parts of the route, he should feed that into the South West transport study. I do, take, uh, I do take exception to his categorisation of a trunk road network. Audit Scotland, who of course are never shy to criticise uh, the government, uh, they in their latest, uh, in their Audit Scotland report in 2016 on the state of our trunk road, said that 87 per cent of the trunk road uh, was in an acceptable uh, condition. Now, there's still work to do, uh, of course, and we want it to be better. That is why we have uh, increased the roads maintenance budget last year uh, by 65 million between 17 and 18 and 2018-19. But if he has suggestions of where we can do further improvement, then of course we'll feed that back to the operating company. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. We move on now to